So on Twitter, people were discussing an older interview with Robert Pattinson and Zoe Kravitz, and I thought I'd throw my two cents into it, because I think the interview sheds a light on some interesting aspects about communication and the culture surrounding gaming and gender both within the community and outside of it. The interview comes from back when they were promoting The Batman from 2022, so it's a bit old, but it got drudged up because of Twitter. Robert and the interviewer end up talking about video games, Final Fantasy VII specifically, which is pretty cool, but things end up going off the rails, especially when the guys start talking about the two female leads, Aerith and Tifa. Zoe makes it clear that she doesn't know video games, so she distances herself from the conversation, but she tells them to continue discussing without her. What game? I mean, I wouldn't know. Doesn't matter. Don't Final, continue. Final Have Fantasy this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> the interviewer gets defensive because he feels like she's being dismissive, since she isn't personally interested in video games, so he accuses her of judging them. You don't know yeah. Final Fantasy? No. It's the best. You it think, was. We think with that child who will never grow up, that's it? You're judging us. I'm not. I'm not. You I'm are. just, I'm standing back and allowing you two to have, I'm... And she probably was to an extent, but in a silence, I'm going to let you guys talk, but I'm going to be over here rolling my eyes kind of way, instead of making fun of them for their interests. And I do think he's being pretty combative here, and it's only exasperating the situation instead of trying to calm things down. Before I continue on with the interview, I want to talk a little bit about video games. Video games are an interesting form of media because you can interact with them. The player has a direct effect on what happens in the game, whereas most other media is passive. You watch movies and listen to music, and that's mostly the extent of it. Because of this interactivity, it's not uncommon for gamers to have many, many hours invested into their games and become very attached to them. The thing is, society as a whole basically sees entertainment as largely a waste of time, and that time could be better invested in doing something productive. And any criticism that other forms of media get is often tenfold for video games, and it's largely due to that time sink. For example, most albums are usually 40 minutes to an hour long, and movies are usually an hour and a half to two hours, maybe three, so those might not be seen as so bad. But doing things like binging seasons of a TV show on a streaming service, or spending many hours a day playing a video game will often get people accused of being a couch potato who could be doing something more important. It's like the mainstream doesn't really see video games as a hobby and more instead just mindless entertainment. Which is unfair, but that's just kind of the fact of the matter. But on top of the mainstream generally seeing video games as a waste of time, they also tend to write off video games as a whole as not real art. For example, back in 2005, a movie adaptation of the video game Doom came out. Many people were critical of the film, including the acclaimed movie critic Roger Ebert. However, a major point he had against the film was that it was based on a video game, because in his opinion, video games are not art and never can be. This, of course, caused a huge backlash from gamers, who were very passionate about their hobby and flooded him with messages about how unfair they thought he was being, which he was, and he eventually addressed all of this in 2010, where he said that he doesn't actually retract his statements or regret making them, but that it was too much trouble because of all the drama it caused, and some opinions are better kept to yourself. He also said he has no interest in playing video games. There are people who just don't care for interactive media and would rather consume media in a passive way, which is totally fine, but there are also people who enjoy enjoy that interactive element, which is also good. But at the end of the day, we didn't really get anywhere, other than everyone just being annoyed with each other. And now it seems like a lot of video games are trying to be interactive movies, and it's great to put a lot of effort into the story, but it kind of feels like it's at the expense of the other aspects of gaming, like gameplay, to the point where maybe they should just make movies. Maybe it's partly because studios want video games to be seen as more legitimate, as an art form, the way music and movies are seen. But in my opinion, it's probably not worth it and they should just focus on making fun games. Anyway, I bring all this up because going into this interview, there's a lot of nuance here, where both sides have their own preconceived notions and biases, but because of how badly they communicated, not only were no bridges built, everyone walked away with their biases being confirmed, which is unfortunate because both sides were not on the same page, and they got two very different things out of the conversation. So in this interview, we have Robert and the interviewer, who both enjoy video games to the point where they admit to crying during them, and Zoe, who seems more in line with the mainstream opinion, and is surprised to hear that they would be so moved by a video game. In common, we cry on video games. <laughs> Wait, what? We cry when we play video games. You do? Just yeah. one. For the same place? I place. cried in the same scene. Yeah. Final, Final Fantasy. Fantasy. What game? I mean, I wouldn't know. Doesn't matter. Don't Final continue. Final Have Fantasy this conversation. <laughs> 
Both the mainstream and gamers can be pretty stubborn. Like Zoe is approaching it by thinking that video games aren't that serious and they aren't for her. So instead of trying to understand why the guys would get so emotional over Final Fantasy VII, she decides to remove herself from the conversation. Meanwhile, instead of the interviewer trying to calmly explain what makes Final Fantasy VII so great, he immediately gets accusatory. And the guys start to try to justify themselves and keep pulling her into a conversation that she admitted she didn't really want a part of. So we're already not off to a good start. And things only get worse from here when they bring up the two female leads, Aerith and Tifa. Robert tries to explain their characters to Zoe, but he uses some choice language that in my opinion is a very surface level reading of the characters. First of all, he describes the situation as a love triangle, which isn't true. There are romantic themes and romantic tension, and ship wars. Fandom's got a fandom. But the game is so much more than that too. But a love triangle has some preconceived notions attached to it. Also, the fact that this is coming from Robert Pattinson, aka Edward Cullen from Twilight, is not helping the situation. Love triangles are usually seen as very shallow, like the characters involved can't operate on their own, and that the love triangle is the center of the entire story, so nothing else matters. These are actually very deep and complex characters, both male and female, but the way he talks about it makes it come off as the most generic nonsense and something that would be immediately dismissed to someone who's not familiar with the game. He goes on to describe Aerith as a sweet and kind healer. It's a love triangle uh -huh. where Aerith or Aerith, depending on what, what version of the game you have, uh -huh. it's sometimes mistranslated. Like, she's like the really kind girl who has, this, that has superpower, it's like to like heal everyone. And, like, which is accurate, sure, but also only one aspect of her character. But before I get into the character analysis, Zoe already has a problem with this. She's like the really kind girl who has, this, that has superpower, it's like to like heal everyone and like make the world Ugh. a better place. Or I mean, women, we have to heal everyone. I mean, teeth is like this, like, sex. Since she doesn't have any context for Final Fantasy VII, and is going off assumptions based off of the love triangle description, and mainstream opinions about video games in general, what she heard and what he was trying to convey were totally different things. He means that during battle, she can restore health. Also, she's a descendant of the Ancient Ones and has a special connection to the planet, but I won't get too much into the lore. She can fight too, but he didn't mention that. The thing is, the mainstream is unaware of video game class Classes. You know, the tank, the knight, the healer, the rogue, things like that. But without the context, Zoe is probably thinking she's in a literal caretaker role, and that she probably has to take care of everyone else's problems, while also neglecting her own needs. A lot of angst from both men and women comes from feeling unappreciated, and that can be the case with caretakers, having to put others' needs above your own, and clean up other people's messes, and you can't really take a day off. Otherwise, things could go wrong, or you'd be seen as a failure, both selfish and lazy. And that's a lot of pressure, and usually it's women seen in these roles. That's why she said poor women always having to be the healer, so exhausting. Meanwhile, the guys have no idea what she's on about. They're talking about how much they love this video game. While Zoe is not only not on the same page, she's basically reading a different book. So while healer is a totally normal class in video games, she's associated with a stereotype. And bringing this up isn't actually adding anything to the conversation. And that's not what happens with Aerith's character. Meanwhile, Zoe is also playing into stereotypes. Again, unintentionally. But her dismissive attitude towards Aerith being a healer comes off like she's saying Aerith shouldn't be bothered to have to save the world, and only focus on her own wants and needs. Which comes off as extremely selfish when we know that the world itself is at stake. So now both sides are basically jumping to the worst possible conclusions. That being said, Robert did a pretty poor job at describing the situation, and the only reason why he's talking about Aerith this way is because he's comparing her to Tifa. And in my opinion, they're both misrepresented. His description of Tifa is not very flattering. I'm sure he thinks it's flattering, but it comes off as very shallow. He says that she's a sex girl who wears a short skirt and is a thief. I mean, teeth is like this like sexy little thing. He's like a thief and stuff to wear the short skirt. And you're like, I can't decide. I get that he's going to focus on their looks, but this is not a good representation of Tifa's character. She's not even a thief. I think he got her confused with Yuffie. He also kind of makes it sound like she's a sex worker, which he probably didn't mean to, but it does come off that way. Especially when comparing her to the kind healer and saying that they're the two choices of women. But it's the two sides, it's the, it's the two options of girls you can have to- But I'll get into that. 
Tifa and Aerith are great characters and are very layered, and describing them this way is limiting. Sure, Aerith looks cutesy, but she's actually pretty assertive and a tough cookie, though you might not get that based solely on her design. Tifa, on the other hand, may look like a sex girl in a short skirt, although that's a very shallow statement and is only based on her design, but she's actually very caring, empathetic, and sweet, and she can be pretty reserved. Specifically saying that Aerith is kind and Tifa is sexy also makes Tifa come off off as like she's not kind, maybe even a mean girl, and I really wish he'd given a better description of her. And Aerith, he's not being fair to her either. But not only are both girls great fighters, but they're also really good friends, and they're really not in competition at all. And I'm just not really sure where Robert was coming from, but he did end up playing into a lot of general stereotypes that the mainstream has about video games. Video game characters, regardless of their gender, are often seen as shallow. Video games are just there for wish fulfillment. Male characters that stumble into being the hero. Female characters are only there to be hot and occasionally help out sometimes, but mostly be hot. And the hardest part about video games is which one of these two hot girls do I choose? Robert tries to explain why Aerith's death was so impactful, but instead of actually explaining why it's impactful, he just said that it was sad because they never got to date. And well, then, and then Aerith This is crazy. And Aerith, okay. right at her peak, gets killed. Cool. This is how every guy did, like, figures out what love is. Oh and then it never, it, that's uh, the ideal woman, and then, then it never gets any. It's totally fine that he's attracted to Aerith, and maybe that is why he personally found the scene so sad, but that's selling the scene very short. And honestly, I think video games deserve better, and Aerith deserved better, and also Tifa. People have a tendency to look for confirmation bias, and they ended up doing that here. She's not coming away from this conversation thinking that she was wrong about video games, and that they have a lot to offer outside of shallow wish fulfillment. That's not the end of it either. Robert also provoked another stereotype. It happens when Robert says that Aerith and Tifa are the two options of women that men have to choose from. It's the two sides, it's the, it's the two options of girls you can have to see. The one that's gonna heal everything and the one in the short skirt, these are the options? <laughs> oh my the god. Two options. Basically, it's playing into that stereotype that there are only two kinds of women. The modest and classy one, in this case Aerith, or the sexy bombshell, in this case Tifa. And they may appear that way on the surface, but the problem is these two categories get put into boxes about their character and who they are as people. Like the modest and classy girl can never be playful and flirty, or sassy and tough, while the sexy bombshell is an airhead who's probably selfish and a mean girl. And these two classes of women are constantly competing with each other. People, whether male or female, don't like to be put into a box, or told what they can and can't be, or judged exclusively on their looks. And categorizing people like this is really hollow. This is what Zoe means when she says that this is what's wrong with the world. The one that's gonna heal everything and the one in the short skirt? These are the options? <laughs> this oh my god. Two options. This is the problem <laughs> with the world. People are judgmental and shallow and force people into categories. And the reason these stereotypes are still so prevalent is because the media pushes them, just like what Robert's implying here. But she didn't really do much to explain the mainstream's viewpoint, which caused her to lean into other stereotypes that the gamers have about the mainstream, which is that they're all jealous and judgy. Meanwhile, Robert and the interviewer didn't give her anything to work with, which led to her having confirmation bias against video games. I guess if I had to put it in movie terms, instead of making Final Fantasy VII sound like it was on par with Citizen Kane, they made it sound on par with Twilight. My point is there's a lot of animosity in the community. People are so quick to judge and point fingers and look for confirmation bias to the point where we can't even have conversations anymore because no one's on the same page. This interview proves that people just don't know how to communicate or listen. And to be honest, I don't even think they want to. And things are probably going to get worse if we can't figure out how to talk to each other in a way both sides understand. Because gaming has become so lucrative, the mainstream is taking notice. But it's not because they're respecting video games or taking them seriously. They just want the money. That's why actors are taking precedent at game awards and not the people who actually developed them. This whole thing is a big tangled mess with a lot of nuance and layers, but people are just pointing fingers at the opposite gender and that's not productive. I think if gamers had a better understanding of how the mainstream thinks, then they can communicate better, and the mainstream needs to be more open-minded, instead of just dismissing video games as not having any value. But even so, Robert gave such a shallow description of Final Fantasy VII. It's so much more than a love triangle. 
and Aerith's death was so much deeper than just now Cloud can't possibly date her. But that's just my two cents on the situation. I'm gonna go back to playing Pal World. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. Before I go, I want to give a shout out to the members. Tyrant Carnivore, Shiny Orc Boy, General Bolivar, Depth Charge Media, Samaru163, Gabby Hime, Verdant Range, JVR, Nixel, Phil C, Taylor Ramirez, Caleb Nelson, Dakari the Professor, Equestron, Norman Sweet Cream, Way Beyond Coincidence, Hunter Rose, 80s Nostalgia Guy, Felix Bam, Soundboy00, Lucas Geis, J Draws, Blue Spirit, Meowsers, Sky, JinKZ, Philip, Stutania, Isaac Martinez, Garcia XV Legend, Data Dine Executive, Kitsune Fiora, Tobias Weller, and Bandito Bane. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to become a member, you can hit the join button next to the subscribe button. We also have buy me coffee if you want to support us that way. If you enjoyed the video, you can leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content. And that part's free. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.